Hello and welcome to another classic WOW with Mal podcast. We've got a fantastic show lined up for you today with the news that we've been waiting for dropping earlier today. Phase 5 has been announced and we have a date. We'll be talking about how the stress test on the PTR went and what we might expect to happen once AQ hits. And we'll be talking about that big band wave that happened a couple of weeks ago that we haven't had a chance to get around to. But first, how you doing today, Myth? Doing great. You know, uh, just prepping for all the awesome news that we've been, we've been getting and, uh, you know, looking forward to the future. Yeah, this has been the phase that I have been waiting for pretty much the most out of this entire series that we've had in WoW Classic. Phase 5 and 6 represents the pieces of World of Warcraft that are still unfinished business for a lot of the players in the game. And we've got that date. It is July 28th is when we can begin the process of getting those gates opened. Yeah, I mean, I I didn't expect the news to come out today, honestly. The day, obviously, that we're recording it. Uh, But I'm super glad that they finally announced it. So far from the rumors that I've seen, it's probably going to be a few weeks uh, of a gate opening event, which means we're going to be looking at maybe an end of August AQ, which is, I think, around what I predicted, right? Like, originally near the end of August or early September to actually see the instances open, which is awesome. That puts us at a little bit less than six months of, or a little bit over six months of BWL. And that means that we're probably steadily on course for a January next Ramos opening. Yeah, Phase 5 is, in my opinion, definitely needed to be stretched out a little bit, maybe compared to the other ones, because we're not even going to be getting into AQ40 and AQ20 right out the gate. There's this whole intermediate phase of Phase 5 where we've got to do the war effort, we've got to ring the gong. We've got to get all of that going. And while I think some servers are probably already preparing, I think a lot are really looking at this from a longer term perspective in, hey, how many Scarab Lords can we get? What's more beneficial for the mass population of the server? Yeah, for sure. Plus, I mean, a lot of servers have to be considering right now how how devastating to the server economy the war effort is. Uh, like, even even the servers who want to open the gates as quickly as possible people are going to gouge the living hell out of prices for the weeks that people are, you know, needing to turn things in. Well, the price for entry right there, if you want to buy any of them, is going to be at least the green item that they're worth, plus the value of the item, plus whatever the gouge is. That's going to, you know, that's several levels of gouging going on already. For sure. Something like 20 like a turn in of like 20 rune cloth bandages, you think, oh, well, I can make 20 rune cloth bandages for like six gold. But if you consider that those 20 rune cloth bandages are going to turn into at least a green piece of armor, maybe a green weapon, that adds a couple gold to their value. And then you, you consider the fact that people are just going to, who have a decent amount of gold already, are going to buy out the marketplace or are already buying the marketplace out these days. I see like it's clean most of the time I check it of a lot of these materials and they're just planning on selling them at like incredibly high prices the second that the the update goes live. Yeah. And it's going to be interesting to see how many people have actually planned that out and what the level of competition is going to be because 
if there does become an, a flood, there's going to be people that are going to be sick of holding on to the items. And they're going to have a choice, actually. Do they want to hand them in and just accept the items that they get back, which is pretty viable, actually. That's a pretty good strategy to make some money, especially for a lot of those items that are not all that valuable. Or do they play the market a little bit and try and maximize the value out of it? It'll be interesting to see how that aspect gets handled. And of course, each server is going to have a little bit of a different take on what the optimal strategy is. I'm not necessarily of the belief that the, getting the gates open immediately is the best for everybody. I mean, uh, our server's already had a, a decent amount of talking points. Uh, we've had meetings and such, you know, to those to those exact means. We we want to be we want to prove to the classic WoW community that Grobulus is the best place to be. And one of the ways that we can show them that is by banding together as a server and really putting forward as more scare boards than any other classic server can muster. And right there, this is something that is part of WoW Classic that isn't something that you're going to be getting in a lot of other games at this point in time. People having to come together toward a common goal that wouldn't necessarily be in that situation, but they're incentivized for doing so, is going to be happening in this phase. Very similar to what I went through when I was doing the PvP ranking system. I was in a better spot by working with the other people on my server and politicking and influencing the way that they were experiencing it and getting to this conclusion that, yeah, this is better for everybody if we work together. And while certainly no system is perfect, it is cool to see that many, many months later, we're still ranking system within our server. And I hope that this type of camaraderie happens in the AQ gates opening because this would be a monumental moment for Grobulus if we could see Many, many Scarab Lords come out of this, both Horde and Alliance. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm really excited. I really, I mean, I personally plan to help both our guild, myself, and as many other people as, as, as humanly possible do this. Yeah, this is something where I, my big grinding days of World of Warcraft are definitely over. Um, but I definitely want to help out those that are going for Scarab Lord because... This is a very cool one-shot, one-time opportunity, and there just aren't a lot of events in video games like this anymore. And quite frankly, I, I hope, uh, whether I choose to play Shadowlands or not, I hope that maybe something of this magnitude maybe rears its head in the Shadowlands expansion and gives me a little bit of hope that large community-based events are going to still be a piece of MMOs because they are incredible and there's a lot of different ways you can do them. But when you affect the entire server, it's always monumental. Yeah, it's uh, I'm, I'm really excited to see how we do. But with that being said, circle July 28 because that is when we can finally get beyond this phase that I think, at least in my opinion... BWL has maybe dragged on just a little bit longer than I would have liked it to, and I am ready for this next phase of the game that really I've been waiting for for almost a year now. Yeah, we'll we'll uh, this is if we're being honest, this is the part of the this is the part of the game that I've I've wanted basically since it started. Like I I did BWL back in Classic. I never got to finish. I never got to finish AQ. I never got to really go through next so like we're finally getting to the part of classic that like i never felt like i i really finished before well and especially for me like i had my guild had seethan under 20 percent. like you know we were that close to beating Cthune. you know obviously this is post nerf so what are you gonna you know but we were close and it was just it slipped by and that still bugs me a little bit to this day there are several bosses in next i didn't get the opportunity to face at the time these are things that never sat well with me, and now we are approaching that point in the game where I get to rewrite that history, and I'm very, very excited about it. Yeah, I mean, Cthune, I'm, I'm excited to see Nax because of sort of the nostalgia, the nostalgia of it, and I only ever did like two or three bosses back in the day, but really, as a, as a huge HP Lovecraft person, I, I just love the Cthulhu mythos, and so Cthune is really like at the top of my list of things to do. And... 
it just, it's a fascinating fight. Like, it's just one of the more bizarre moving pieces fights. There's, you know, there's these different phases. You get swallowed into the stomach. There's just, it's a lot of chaos. And while it, you know, there's other difficult fights, like Twin Emperors really took some time for my guild to really piece together. It really took a lot of us to improving our gameplay to beat it. But the chaos level of Cthune is just outrageous and it's going to be fun to relive it I and mean, get to relive some of those experiences the part that yeah. i won't be looking forward to so much is some of the trash in these dungeons which is going to be a big step up like if you're not a fan of molten core trash or bwl trash get ready for on courage and naxxaramus because they do kick it up a notch yeah oh the trash is it's it's not even this like there, there's nothing that compares to it yeah, I mean, and I especially remember in Nax, some of those pulls were just downright difficult, harder than some of the bosses, even. Yeah, I, uh, even post, even post level 60, I remember, uh, a group, like, as a group of level 70 people going to finally kill C'Thun for the first time with some of my friends, and wiping to the trash at level 70, just because I wasn't expecting, like, the, the level of ability damage it still did. Yeah, like, the, you know, if you get hit by those lasers, for example, like, it's still a wrap no, no matter what level you are. If you don't have the people and the healing and the means to deal with all that, it still pumps out some damage. So it just, it kind of lets you know, like, how precise those groups at the time on the worst connections without having the game completely solved had to be in order to beat those bosses. And while we're going to have the advantage of having some of the info of the last... 15 years of discoveries, I think it's still going to challenge a lot of us. Yeah, for sure. I, th I think it's going to be the first real step up in raids um, also in terms of difficulty. Like, BWL is, is very clearly, like, harder, air quotes, than Molten Core, but not really, right? Like, most of BWL's challenge comes down to, like, you know, your raid not not being in the wrong position at the wrong time. Yeah, things that you start experiencing in AQ are just completely different, right? Just, you're going to, the amount of calamity that's going on, just the sure amount of damage that can go out when mechanics aren't done correctly. Being out of position is so much more impactful on these upcoming raids that it it's the first step into what modern raiding eventually started looking like as the expansions unrolled. And you can kind of see how they learned a little bit from each one. Yeah, and and again, that's where you you start to see real, uh, like actual player mechanics. Like people need to pay attention to their positioning, as opposed to like, you know, if you're a range, you could just stand sort of wherever you want as long as you're not getting breathed on by a dragon. Yeah, there's going to become a lot of moments where you're going to need to be apart enough that you aren't affecting the people next to you, but spread out enough also that you aren't causing other issues like, you know, well, getting hit by a laser that's going around the room. There's so many layers to what's going to be going on compared to what we've experienced that uh, you're going to start to see a little bit more of a divide, too, I think, in the guilds. There's going to be maybe slightly more clear tiers in terms of each of the guild's abilities or the amount of practice that they've put into as well. Yeah, so we'll... We'll really see how how things go. I still expect a lot of the guilds, even the guilds that like had a bit a bit more trouble clearing BWL. I'm still positive that they'll be able to get through uh, AQ40. Um, like I, I'm sure there will be some guilds that like do legitimately hit a wall. I mean, the guild that I was in died on Twin Imps back in the day. Like we never. I think our best attempt was like five percent, and it was on a server, uh, and the server crashed during that attempt which broke our guild yeah there's gonna be some bigger step ups in this next tier that you know you might be stuck on it for a couple of weeks and that i think has been something that's actually been missing a little bit from the classic experience there sort of does need to be some things to overcome because those are the best moments really and i you know 
Going back to the very, very first time you had something to overcome for a lot of us was Ragnaros, right? Back in the very, very early days when we first ever did Molten Core. And that feeling when you finally got Ragnaros, that cheers erupting within the guild are going to be so much more impactful if you haven't gone through AQ collectively and you do get stuck and you overcome it as a group. This is going to be something that's been missing from Classic for a lot that is going to be there again and it's going to I think increase that level of camaraderie with the people that make it through. Yeah, absolutely. That's so that's that's one of the big feelings that I have that differs between classic and retail. I I really like retail in that it feels better to me to conquer a boss after having wiped to it. E even though like no one likes wiping, right? Like it's never super fun, especially like not that I'm going to claim to be, like, a super elitist, but especially when, like, you don't feel like the wipe was your fault. Like, if you're if you're playing well and, like, there's that one guy in your guild who's always making mistakes or whatever, that's always frustrating, for sure. But, really, they're never... Th that feeling of, like, conquering a challenging situation, it, it just... It hasn't been there for us. And I'm sure there are some guilds who have, you know, uh, some lesser skilled people, some lesser experienced people who, who do get that feeling. But for some of the more hardcore players, I'd really like to to get to that point in Classic WoW. You know, I think that this is one of the things that, while retail and just modern MMOs in general really have made a lot of strides at making these fights very mechanically sound, making them very precise, there is something to be said about the Classic style of rating and finding the balance between those two points I think is very, very powerful. There was a, a tweet that I saw some, you know, could have been three, six months ago at this point. I don't remember anymore. But it was talking about how more people raid in Classic right now than in any other game. Just the sheer number of people, which means there's something going right there. Maybe the formula isn't making things so difficult that most people can't make it through. But maybe the true genius is finding that balance where it's hard enough for most but a challenge still that people can overcome that makes the best raid encounters and i think that aq and nax represent classics best shot at getting that formula correct i mean i think i think the formula and i i hate to sound like a broken record to this because it, it 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 definitely is like a recurring theme of mine and maybe even of this podcast but I definitely think that formula is certainly hurt by world buffs as a concept. Um, I think that the fact that people are killing Molten Core bosses in 12 seconds, even BWL bosses at like absurd rates, is partly a problem. But there's no real... Even, with remo even removing the Molten Core in BWL would be incredibly easy. Um, so we'll, I really hope that the, the onus of, you know, putting some, some requirements on each of the players will really, uh, will really make it a bit more fun and a bit more engaging in that aspect. And also, if you guys can't hear, there's a crazy thunderstorm out here. I apologize if, uh, if that's too loud. By the way, that could actually be happening on either end, although that was definitely mid-send that time, but I am also in the midst of a storm. So I hope that you all are getting great weather wherever you're at right now, because uh, it's been a little uh, little rainy and a little thundery over here as well. Yeah, I I really hope that like having a little bit... Because like, that's, that's what makes raids fun, too, for everybody who, who isn't a healer, right? Like... I, I can't imagine it's super exciting if you play a Frost Mage to do everything in Molten Core, because you just push a button. Like, where you stand is basically not important. So, you know, adding a little bit of flavor and a little bit of mechanics to, the, to these bosses that aren't just, like, extra healing or extra tanking mechanics should really be good for for more than just, like, some players. It should really be helpful for a lot of people. And I think that it also helps add that element of anxiety that sometimes gets a little bit lost when you've done a dungeon way too many times. I was feeling this a little bit when I was playing the EQTLP a couple of weeks ago because I was going through a lot of these zones that were my first 
raids that I ever did. And they brought back a lot of these feelings that I had when I didn't understand everything about the game. When these were things that could definitively kill me. And when you get rid of some of that mystery over a long stretch of time, you miss out on some of that. And it's going to be good to get some of that back through AQ and Nax because I think we're going to have some some moments where we go like shoot I I this this boss is really uh, affecting me right now. Yeah, I'm I'm really curious what bosses are actually going to are, are going to do that uh, the most. The one that comes to mind in Nax that I think is going to be really it's going to be really telling of uh, the guilds that have players that have sort of been getting along by the fact that like there's no real mechanics in fights. I think the first true one, I guess depending on who you get to first, it's either going to be Hygen because of the dance or Thaddeus because of the polarities. Yeah, it's going to be, I'm, I'm kind of with you in that I think it's going to be the one that tests your guild's ability to coordinate and work as a team the most is going to be that first hold up. I think we're going to do very good at the gear checks, at the gut checks out there. Like, I don't think... You know, Grobulus, for example, is necessarily going to do exactly what it might have done to a guild back then. However, I do think that those coordination ones might tell a little bit more of the table. We will see, though, because there's, you know, certainly there's a lot of more experienced MMO players that have done harder fights. I think in pretty much every guild, right? Even if your guild isn't stacked with them, I think there's a lot of us have at least several players that can help usher in the rest of those people to that level i think one of the one of the one of the biggest changes that's going to exist in uh nax is the fact that patchwork's damage check is going to be much less of a uh of like a hard a hard stop for guilds because damage in general is just way higher yeah and it's like you're just not going to be burdened with the same problems that you were back then be you know it's kind of similar to veil right veil was a little bit of a problem for some guilds right it was like a a little bit of an issue for us but like a four or five wipe issue not like a four or five week issue like it might have been for a guild back in vanilla because of how much bigger the damage output is going on whereas yeah. something where you really have to be precise versus it you know Something like Fire Maw, where it's maybe what we've learned is that fight held the test of time better than a lot in BWL because it doesn't really matter if you just if you die in that fight, you'll peter out. Like it just it doesn't matter. And I think that that will happen on some of the more mechanic intense fights in AQ and uh, Nax for sure. Yeah, I'm curious. I'm curious which ones because like I don't I don't really see back at so. My classic experience, I only ever did the easy version of the trio. So I don't know what the har the two harder versions of it are. I've never done that. The guild I was in was Alliance, so we never even tried Visitus. Um, like, we tried one time and wiped, so we just stopped. And uh, we we got we got stuck on the Twin Emps. So, really, I don't remember Huhu being hard. Fankris was always pretty easy. And Battleguard was always pretty easy. I, I really... I don't think there's going to be much challenge except for the last couple of bosses and the optional bosses in AQ. Yeah, I think that we're going to see a couple of roadblocks versus I think Nax may have several sprinkled throughout. And I think that'll, you know, that's going to be shown in that it was the next tier up. But AQ will definitely, you know, it, you, it's an apparent step up and just, just the, how many mechanics are going to just be dealt with for sure. And fortunately, the 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 one thing that I feel, and there have been obviously like great sprinkled pieces throughout so far, but I really feel that AQ is when gear starts getting like you start getting like the best piece for your class, especially like all the Cthulhu loot is like irreplaceable for everybody who puts it on. Yeah, and this is we talked about this before too. It really starts to coincide with when they started. And these are all tied together, right? Making these bosses more precise. Understanding how much damage could be put out. Tuning things to how much damage could be taken versus how much damage could be put out. And all of these little 
sprinkles and bits in between and you started to see the talent trees change during the same time all of these adjustments that eventually made their way into modern rating sort of start right in this area yeah so we'll uh we'll see how that how that ends up turning out one thing that could give us a little bit of a preview as to what we're going to expect on july 28th will be some of these stress tests that happened on the ptr and blizzard had put out a blue post with a little bit of information about what they've learned that might give us an idea of what we can expect july 28th and the events around that to look like yeah so the the blue post was after so they put out feedback after the first of the two stress tests between the two of them I think to give us, the, the general public, a bit of idea, like, why the first... I mean, why the AQ gate event is so historically laggy, why the, why like, the servers crash, like, what's going on. And I found a lot of the information to be pretty interesting, especially with how they're working on affecting change. Um, like, one of the things they talked about was how, since your player has to, like, advertise that you have a slow debuff, like, if you're slowed, you have to, like, other players have to be able to see that you're slowed. So, it, it just, apparently, it's, like, exponential, for, for like, the number of players exponentially increase the number of packets the server effectively has to send out. So, when there's, like, thousands upon thousands of players in the same location, or same zone... There's like there, there's millions and millions and millions of packets every time any debuff, any slow, anything happens. So the more players in the area, the worse it becomes. And one of the one of the ways they said they were combating that is making it so that like you just in, you don't in, instantaneously show to other players that you're slowed even though your character is slowed, which is I think a like a good way to reduce server traffic, like a really a really interesting and unique way to help solve this i don't think it will completely solve it but i don't think there's a way to completely solve it yeah this is something that just sort of goes hand in hand with the event that we're trying to take place right we're trying to create an atmosphere that's going to be chaos and chaotic with everybody in it there's gonna be some issues with that and it's kind of what we expect too right most people i know don't want to see all of us split up and not have it be it's kind of a lag fest at the same time, if they can be wise about how they distribute some of that load and how the server is handling it and how it affects our experience, we want to have as much ability to explore the world in all of its chaos and glory with everything going on as we can. Well, because like with like lower, if they had like lower versions of layering, like even though I'm hoping layering is sort of a solution. There are so many elites that spawn during this event uh, that, like, one raid team couldn't even handle it. Like, e even the best raid team would get overrun by the number of massive truck-hitting elites that spawn, like, nonstop. Yeah, I mean, we're like, basically going to be going through, like, a gauntlet of bosses during this time. And our one shining benefit is we've got the entire server to back us up for this. Yeah, so it'll be, like, you really do need the whole, like, the whole group of people. And it's happening am among multiple zones, so w it really doesn't matter where you show up. If you're in really in any of these zones, there is something epic to be taking part in. Yeah, even lower level characters will have some fun stuff to do. Honestly, some of them may even get some pretty uniquely amazing experiences just because not everybody is necessarily going to be holding up all of those areas but it's going to be stuff that not everybody is seeing yeah so if you if you're if you're like locked out and unable to get into silithus on a character you could keep trying or one of the other things you could try and do is you know go to tanaris go to uh the the flats go to ungoro try and kill the stuff there there's still going to be a plenty to do elsewhere in the world if you are unable to uh, if you're unable to zone into Silthus because of the lag. Yeah, even the Barons is going to have a big piece of this, so it's pretty much going to be all throughout Kalimdor and many, many locations in it. So this is a, a great opportunity for players of all levels to uh, really get a feel for, a, you know, a true world event, right? Like, this is the biggest world event that we are going to see in World of Warcraft. Yeah, I mean, it's it's historically the biggest world event that that happened in like an MMO, at least any that I've, that I've ever heard of. 
Yeah, nothing that I've ever been a part of has been as ambitious as the AQ Gates opening. And uh, we're, we're getting to live this again. So uh, get ready for that. There's going to be a lot coming with Phase 5, and we'll talk a little bit more about some of the exciting things that come with that in future episodes. But one thing that we haven't had an opportunity to talk about yet was this big band wave that came out over the last couple of weeks that took out 74,000 bots in World of Warcraft Classic. And... The response from the players was extremely happy, very, very positive. Certainly the bots immediately got back to work, but this is a great sign. For sure. I mean, it's it's sort of like proof that Blizzard is doing, doing something, and uh, so, some of the articles that I've read um, help to explain why they don't ban bots uh, as frequently as, I guess, players would expect. Um in an attempt to make it harder for the bots to determine what is causing them to be discovered. Which makes sense. Like, I didn't really think of it from that perspective before, but I didn't. I don't work in, in that... I don't work in that, like, line of, of business, so I don't think I, I ever would have considered that as an option. But it's good. It's, I definitely think that it's good that it's been done because it was getting pretty egregious. Well, and one thing too, and this is just, this is even Blizzard back in the old days, right? I, as a GM, had quite a bit of power, right? I could do all kinds of things. I could suggest that somebody be banned. I could put an action on somebody's account. I could restore items. You know, there was quite a few powers that I had. None of the inner workings of how they got to bots ever, ever, ever got discussed with anybody on the GM level, right? We, had we caught a bot red-handed, would take him out of the game and handle that ourselves. But we were not even given any sort of an inkling of what that inner working was like because that's how hard it is to stay one step ahead. Yeah, so, you know, it's, it's, it's good that they're still working on it. And, uh, you know, I don't really think there's, there's a whole lot we can do with that regard. Like, we kind of just got to let them do their thing. They'll ban them when they when they get around to it, when they have, like, a sufficient amount of them. Uh, I mean, I, I know we've already been seeing plenty of reports of, like, more bots leveling up. We see, like, waves and waves of of uh, bot-like characters running around in low-level zones. But, uh, I mean, it's, it's sort of never-ending, right? Like, I feel like, like the, the size of Classic and the popularity of, of Classic at this point is sort of, like making bots more profitable than ever. Well, and the problem too is a botter will most likely go into this understanding that that bot is going to get popped eventually. And so what's, what do you do? Well, I got some new ones ready to go waiting in the wings. It's not a huge issue to a botter to have a thousand bots taken offline one day when the solution is just bottom right back to where you got them. And that's just something that that's just the internet right like how do you stop something that's a problem of the internet every company has to have some sort of a defense of bots that's why we have those stupid captchas yep although i think they're working on developing like a a bot that can like start to tell what those are it's uh the same along the same lines uh so i actually heard in an interesting thing about those captchas it's the ones that ask you to like determine stop 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 signs and like pictures of like stoplights uh, or signs in general were being purchased and used to help companies who are developing driverless cars recognize just stop signs on mass, which is I think a really cool use for that. Yeah, that's actually pretty fascinating. Just the idea to think that the multi layers that you can get out of determining what a bot can figure out, right? Are they accurate enough to read a stop sign? And can we then parlay that into technology, into driving cars, which, you know, in theory, like if you got self-driving cars to an end conclusion place, that could actually make driving safer in the long run. I read an article about that a while ago, and I thought that was just an interesting, just random side point. Yeah, I mean, not that, you know, we're going to go too deep into the self-driving car uh, 
idea, but you know, hey, it's just uh, these mechanical ways that we live life are a part of life. And so it really shouldn't be a surprise that they make their way into World of Warcraft too. We totally got to do something about them when they're uh, hurting the overall experience and making it worse for the legitimate players of the game. Yeah, the only thing I, I am sort of sad about is I wonder how many just sheer materials disappeared with those account bans, like into the black into the black void of non-existence. Like, imagine how many of those bots just had stacks of Crusader orbs and stacks of Black Lotuses that just now don't exist at all. Or even all those stacks of Plague Bloom I didn't find all over Felwood the other day. Yeah, it it would be... Man, it'd be... It would be funny, I think, if whenever Blizzard banned accounts like that, if, like, the GM or whatever ba who was banning them... Like, that GM just put all those things up on the auction house for sale for, like, a low price. I actually think they should have the do the same thing, but, like, let it be open bid in Stormwind and Orgamar, right? Like, all right, we got 20 Black Lotuses on a bot account. What's my lowest bidder here? What's the highest bid coming up? Do I hear 1,000 gold? Do I hear 1,500? They could give them, the, the GMs could just, like, give them away as, like, fancy duel prizes. Like, duel me in a fair duel, and if you beat me, I'll give you a Black Lotus. Just, the GM just sits there all day dueling people. This is actually something that That's Blizzard fun. never really felt was a positive thing in the game that I always sort of disagreed with. Which is, they always felt like GMs took away from the flow of the game. You know, they're, they make you stop and stare, which is true. Every time I ever saw a GM in EverQuest, we immediately crowded around them because they, they you didn't see them all the time. They're showstoppers, and Blizzard never really liked that. But I think the players do. So the only time I've ever seen a GM in, in game, which I uh, very distinctly remember, was on the last day of the Burning Crusade beta, the day it was getting shut down. There was a GM in... Shatrath. He was a giant, like a 20 foot tall peon. And he was just spawning like Onyxia, Nefarian, just in Shatrath. And it was awesome. It was the coolest. They were just, world, they were, like, Ragnaros was in Shatrath. Like, he was just spawning raid bosses just as, like, a goodbye to the Burning Crusade beta. Like, he thanked all of us for participating and for giving as much feedback as we had. And it was, like, a really cool send-off to see him show up and just, like, fill Shatrath with raid bosses. Yeah, and something like that, which certainly would fit into that, you know, turn-your-head, showstopper category, I think just, that's a great memory right there. The last day wouldn't have been the same without it. And I think that Blizzard maybe could have been a little bit better about some of these community-type things. I don't think this has really ever been... One of their strong suits, honestly. They kind of, in my opinion, dropped the ball on what they could be doing with their community managers, with their GMs, in terms of what they give back to the players. Because I think, generally speaking, the players do want to hear from these people and do want some sort of an access to them. I think I made a suggestion in a previous episode where I, I think they should have a GM that's on stream that's sitting there handling tickets right there so we get a, a feel for what it is that's actually going on behind the scenes without giving us too much right something that's carefully curated and you know sends out the message that blizzard wants us to get but still gives us a little bit more access than we would have had 15 years ago absolutely so there's a there's a game company that i've i've been a fan of for a long time i've played quite a bit of this this game uh it's called warframe uh, it's a. It's been out since like it was in. I, I've been playing since Alpha in like 2011. Um, it's like Space Ninjas. I'm sure at, at this point most people have heard of it because it's it's free and it's it's actually you know pretty interesting. Um, one of the reasons that I've been such a fan of this game for so long isn't necessarily the gameplay. I'm not particularly the biggest fan of like not super like tight shooters because it's a shooting game, but like. The gunplay isn't all, like, uh, it's not, like, the highest quality gunplay you're ever going to see. 
The thing that has kept me about this game and this company for so long has been how well they communicate with the people who play their game. Every other week since Alpha, they have done a uh, like a dev stream where the head of each department and the head of the community get together. They give free stuff away to people in game. They talk about changes. They talk about stuff they're planning on doing every other week for 10 years, almost almost 10 years at this point. And it's that level of communication. I have more respect for them as a development team than any other development team making video games because they listen to their player base. They had one of their lead designers uh, in an attempt to understand what it's like to be a new player create a free account, like do the incognito new player experience. And he's like, well, there, these are a bunch of uh, pain points that I found. And we're going to, we're going to redesign the new player experience around what I've found out because you guys told us this wasn't that great. So like when, when game companies and developers really listen and really communicate frequently with their team, with their people, I think it just b builds a better community and I would agree with you wholeheartedly that I think the single, maybe the single biggest place that Blizzard has failed is to really be honest and open and just keep in contact with their community. Yeah, the problem that Blizzard sort of runs into in this regard, in my opinion, is that they have notoriously always, even back when I worked there, 15 years ago, been a keep it close to the vest kind of company. They don't like to let things get out before the product is polished and ready until they have exactly what they know they want to put out. And I understand and respect that very much, but they may not have the message quite right at this era when so many companies are better about giving us a little bit of a preview and giving us a little bit more insight without spilling all the beans and turning it into a full leak that they can't feel like they can't keep the narrative over. And that's where Blizzard could really improve. And there's certain things where I think that a lot of companies are doing that they could just, you know, like I said, like that other side, I understand that they don't want to leak anybody's privacy. However, People at this point in time, you know, we're kind of past the point of like, if someone's botting, I don't think many of us care about their privacy all that much at this point. I mean, who's who? OK, so if you're banning a bot, who's using like a legitimate email address, first of all, like it's not going to be it's not going to be my two names and my birth year at Gmail dot com. Right. Like no one. None of these botters are using legitimate email addresses. Um, my roommate uh, worked for a long time. At, with web hosting and you basically can tell immediately if the email address that's a, that's signing up for your service is a bot email or not like you just know and so like that i don't really think that would be that big a deal like, there might be like some sort of a uh, american or especially now that the eu has a lot of laws against it there may be some sort of like privacy law that that would break so maybe that's not the best the best way to go about it I think in the in the suggestion that you have, it might make more sense for that GM to only have like specific interactions, like ones that weren't personal, but that players could see. You'd probably like curate the things that that GM did on the stream, or even prior to the ticket being completely answered, get, just give the player the option, like, "Hey, you are you have the option to have this taken by." the GM that's on our live stream right now, is this okay with you? And the player could consent right there. That could even be an avenue that would allow you like, hey, wait a sec, I could get to talk to that. I know that GM. Yeah, sure. I would love to speak to that GM. And that could actually be a bridge that could help us, the player, understand exactly where Blizzard was at. The suggestion that I have in the, the comparison to, to the, the dev team for for Warframe isn't that I would want Blizzard I, I'm, I'm perfectly happy with Blizzard wanting to keep things close to the vest and not really talk about them until they're they're like release level one of the things that they don't like say upcoming patches right on the dev stream and we they do announce them on those dev streams whenever they're ready to be announced um but like an ex examples of what they do is they'll show like 
a piece of early artwork for something they're working on to everybody to like give them like a just a you know a little bit of like we we respect you guys for watching us and we're really happy that you're here so like take a look at what we're working on internally but we're not going to tell you like it's context we're not going to tell you really anything about it other than you know this is what we're doing right now so you know it gives people something cool to see it gives people the ability to you know feel like they're being respected by the team that's working on this and at the same time it's easy content for them all they have to do is show someone oh well this is a cool piece of artwork that may or may not get used in the future Right, and with Blizzard, with the amount of people that work there, with the amount of people that are working on a project on literally 24-7, 365, that place never is closed, you just, it's you're either working or you're not, but somebody in that building is working. There's always something to show. You wouldn't even need to tip off more than 2% of what you have under wraps, and we would never be none the wiser, and I think it would equate to the player feeling so much more connected to modern blizzard which is something that they, they kind of got to overcome right now still even today and then as as far as like the contest that they have during all those dev streams if you tune in they'll they have like a bot that like randomly picks a twitch viewer or randomly picks a youtube viewer because i think they started streaming on both and then whoever whoever that viewer is randomly wins like a little bit of a prize so like the prize blizzard could be giving away is oh well you get a credit for one store mount on retail or you get uh, a three-month sub for free like that would be an awesome prize it would incentivize people to to tune in during the time to watch all of those i mean i know there's not really like prizes they can really give away in classic um other than like game time but like they could give away like w whenever they announce uh the new expansion they could give away like two deluxe additions to the ex to the new expansion for everybody who's watching. Like, there's so much stuff they could do that wouldn't really cost them that much that would buy them incredible, incredible equity with their community. That I... It's just... It is... I it, It's surprising to me that no one's really talking about this internally. And if they do, they're not listened to more. Yeah, and that also might, too, be a product of it being a company with so many people and so many moving parts, right? I encountered this even a little bit when I worked there. It takes a little while for policies to even change. But this one particularly doesn't necessarily feel like it's ever really ever been on the radar, which is why, kind of like you said, it's kind of surprising that it doesn't feel like there isn't at least some version of this going on behind the scenes. Yeah. I mean, it's it's someone has to have said something. It's not like no one's ever said, "Hey, we should talk to our people more." But you know, it really again, it really does surprise me that that's not more of a more of a gesture that they're willing to do. Because I mean, uh, look at something that Blizzard has started doing recently that I think has been really productive. the The lead developer and some of the lead developers on the Diablo Four team have been doing quarterly updates, where you know every couple of months, and one just got posted last week which is what's making me think about it, where they talk about, you know, what the team's been up to and sort of the the changes they're, they're working on making in the grander scheme. They're not saying, like, minute things about the story or minute things about how, you know, items are going to work, but they're just giving big, broad strokes. And it's I think it's a great insight into the development process of Diablo 4, uh, the team itself. And I, I just think more transparency like that and more community engagement there's like no downside as long as you're not doing things like oh we promised to fix this by wednesday like and that's super easy to do just don't say that yeah and blizzard is plenty practiced about not giving any promises out so that shouldn't be an issue at all right they are notoriously good at giving everything that oh you can expect this but we'll be giving you that final call on that I mean, I feel like soon TM as a meme was, was coined by, like, Blizzard itself. Exactly, exactly. But with that being said, there this is a very, very exciting time to be in the Blizzard universe with all that's going on with AQ Gates coming out, Shadowlands coming soon. We've got some Diablo 4 news coming out. So this is a, a good time for them to uh, be thinking about some of these concepts. 
Let's take a quick look at what's happened on the great server of Grobulus these last couple of weeks, starting with some monumental accomplishments from the women of Grobulus, starting with this group of 20 women that have cleared Zolgarab. Congratulations, ladies. Yeah, I think I saw a post just the other day that it happened again this week. Like, they've done it two weeks in a row. Yeah, I think two. I don't know if this has actually already happened or not. That might have even been the second one. But I think they're planning to do a Horde side one, too. That was, first one was an Alliance side. But the uh, leader, uh, at least to my understanding of the group, Julie Cat, has a, a, a Horde side character as well, a Warlock. And I think she'll be uh, leading the charge for the Ladies of the Horde as well. So if you're interested in doing a little bit of raiding definitely hit her up because uh hey that's just a cool thing to do to grab a group of people that is definitely not the majority on the server and come together for a cool accomplishment like that and uh always cool to see just some of the um some of the unique things that players are coming up with in some of the all dwarf raids we saw an all druid uh, ragnaros happen recently we had an all paladin one so some of these cool themed raids have become a big part of the classic community another big one that happened for the ladies was the horde got their first female high warlord in high warlord clover so huge congratulations there as well yep uh i think that was was that last week or was that this week yeah that was last week and uh it was cool because i actually got to pvp with clovers a little bit during my grind and that was around when she was rank I want to say eight or nine and she was just sort of putting the idea together whether she was going to go maybe for 12 or 13 but she had this idea in the back of her mind that she really really wanted to go for 14 and she got there which is uh that's freaking incredible congratulations clovers yeah i mean not a whole lot of people can say even today that they've done that like it's i mean obviously classic coming back out has given a great number of people the chance to to get high warlord that never did before but even that even that community is still very small like you're still part of an incredibly small circle of people who are very dedicated so congrats yeah and while it's uh you know it's certainly obtainable especially if you've got the ability to you know work from home or something like many of us have during covid and potentially post covid um, but it still takes a lot of discipline to make sure that you get that done every day. You put in the hours. It's a, and it's a long process, right? It's a minimum three months. And for most people, it's going to be more. So huge congratulations there. Very cool to see. Yeah. Uh, actually, uh, another, another awesome shout out. This coming week, uh, we have another one of our guild members hitting High Warlord in Hombre Macho. Yes. Hombre Macho. He's been he's he he decided to start grinding around the time you hit it, and he's he's just I think he's he's eighty eighty one percent right now to fourteen. Yeah, the funny thing too is he was actually another person that filled in on my teams back then, but as a druid, right? He was playing a druid at the time, but he uh, started a warrior and did the grind as a warrior. So you know, just uh, it's kind of cool to see that there's now a generation of people that pretty much started after the generation that my people were grinding and hit it and uh you know in with the tide right one tide comes in and then another goes out and another back in so congratulations to clovers to ombre macho and really anybody either horde or alliance side that's been doing the grind it's a huge accomplishment when you get it done feels great and uh man those weapons are sweet still love playing with them even today yeah i uh and i mean it's 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 pretty fun too. The the PvP has continued to evolve. Like I I've taken several months off of like legitimately PvPing, even though I obviously didn't grind like you did beforehand. Because back when when I was PvPing before, the queue times were getting pretty long. The war songs and the I mean Alterac Valley was like unbearable for me. It was like two hour queues. It was crazy. But one of the cool things that I've seen, because this week I, I did, I've been doing a bit, a bit more PvP like with the guild with Ombre, because he's, you know, he's he's hitting it, and we've got some other people PvPing. Uh, is it's I'm really surprised that queue times have changed so much. Like we were getting into Warsong and Arathi Basin almost instantly, even at like three in the morning, 
Yeah, the queue times right now are downright reasonable. I was shocked myself. We used to have, you know, we had certain times a day that we knew to be on because that's when the queues were the best, right? Like early in the morning was always the best time to get on. You could get in and out in five minutes. You can get in and out in five minutes way better now at any time of day that we were PVPing. And if some of those were during the peak hours. It was downright reasonable to get into a PVP match on the Horde side. And there was a long period of time where that was absolutely not the case. And you can queue weave and do a few other things too to make the queues even more reasonable. So even if you don't want to grind, if you're just looking for a good match, get like a few guildies together. You know, put a group, six people, seven people together, and you can compete with a good chunk of what you're going to run into in those groups. Yeah, I think it makes it makes getting maybe on newer characters it makes getting rank like between rank eight and ten very reasonable these days yeah that's not even a commitment that i feel like you need to commit more than a couple of days and a couple of hours in those days to with those types of cues right you just need to get a few hours of wins in and you'll be somewhere in there enough to make slow progress and then by the time you start getting up a little bit higher, you can kick it up a little bit of a notch to finish off your grind, but that can fit into most people's normal gameplay. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think if I treated if I treated PvP like how, how how I treat our rating schedule, I think I could be ranked ten in like a month. Like that's and that wouldn't even be that unreasonable. And that's pretty crazy. Like it's it's awesome that it's gotten that good, and I'm I'm, I'm really surprised that that's happened that way. Like I would have figured. The longer the game went on, the worse queues would have been, just because, you know, as High Warlords get get their titles, a lot of them burn out from queuing like that, right? Like, there are some people who are, like, gonna be north of rank 10 the entire time. Like, there, I've met, I've seen people on our server who got High Warlord or Warlord, and that was the end of their grind, but they've still never dropped in real ranks. Like, they're not pushing the top brackets because they don't want to go up, but they're not going down either. They still PvP as their primary mode of enjoyment for this game. But I'm just, I'm really surprised that the number is, is continuing to get better instead of getting worse. Yeah, that's actually just great news from, you know, to me because there's always that part that said it was going to be its kind of, you know, quote unquote worst when everybody had it on the table. But, you know, certainly you were right. There was that fear that maybe some of these communities would die out. And I think this is the long-term benefit that Cross Realm did provide is that it kept enough of a community that it could keep things fluid regardless of what the circumstances are. And I think we're now getting into that point where, yeah, you know, you're going to get enough of a, a, you know, I see people on my own server. Heck, the first match we played was a, a Grobulus match the other day when we did some Arathi Basin, you're going to get those matches occasionally, but you're also going to get good queue times, which I think is the best long-term thing for everybody. Well, the thing that makes me really hopeful in seeing how, how well this is working is I'm really looking forward to the Burning Crusade. And I, and if, if PVP is staying this fresh on Classic for this long, I, I'm really excited to see how, how, how fun Arena is going to be again. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Because Arena is... Without a doubt, a step up from the battleground. Remember, sometime, you know, right around the same time back in the vanilla days, our uh, mage now, former Resto Druid in our guild, Nikon, and I were sitting around at two in the morning at a Denny's thinking about what the flaws that PvP was experiencing and wow, and roughly coming up with a concept that was sort of like Arena. 5v5. Play, you know, it's your skill versus the skill of the players. And then, you know, of course, Blizzard had plenty of their own ideas. But there was a clear need at this point in time in the game for something like Arena that took it right to the individual skill. And while I think that there's a different skill that gets applied in Warsong Gulch and Arathi Basin, a team-based skill, it's about communication. It can be ab against resilience. It can be about coming up with game strategy rather than PvP strategy, Arena is going to round that out real, real nicely. And one of the things that I'm hoping, and we'll see once once we get closer to the Burning Crusade announced, I know we're very off-topic here from Grobulus stuff, but uh, one of the things that I'm really hoping that they do 
is they keep a lot of the eSport aspects of Arena that they've developed over the years for retail in the Burning Crusade so that we can have some, like, awesome competitive Burning Crusade matches that can be, like, really well televised on Twitch or on YouTube the same way that we have retail stuff. Yeah, and I think that with the popularity of PvP tournaments, we've got dueling tournaments, having Arena be able to also reach into that realm is something that Blizzard should be pretty wise to do because I would be very shocked if Burning Crusade didn't get a very similar excitement level that Classic got, and Arena is going to be a huge part of that excitement. So, I mean, I, I'd be surprised if Arena in Burning Crusade isn't more competitive than Arena on retail. Like, in terms of the number of people who come back for it, and, like, the sheer, like, skill level of the people at the top. I, I think, I honestly think it's going to be a more competitive place than retail is right now. Well, I think the great part about it is going to be because it's a great arena to put competitive PvP in, it's going to attract the best players from retail as well as the players that are best interested in Classic. And you might get some of the people that are coming back to this that were maybe great players back then. They're going to learn from a little bit from the evolution of the game. And then they're going to input their skill level with that old knowledge that's been accumulated and really just, you know, create some great matches. I I'm, I can't wait. Oh, yeah. It's going to be, it is going to be the most fun. It's the thing I'm looking forward to the most in the Burning Crusade because I, I mean, pretty much beat beat TBC when it was there. So really the thing... The thing that we're looking, f I'm looking forward to, is really fun, awesome arena competitiveness. Just because, uh, like compared to compared to retail right now, the Burning Crusade has like way less systems that overlap. Like it's it's much more of a pure game. It's still just your talent point and your character skills and your skill level versus your opponents. There's no like you needed to grind this stat to the whatever. Like it's just it's I don't know. It's it's very pure. Yeah, there's just something really to appreciate about something like that. And it's something that I definitely feel is missing from Classic. It kind of always did. Like, there's that itch to have, like, to figure out, okay, so who's actually the best PvPer? And uh, we're going to know. So, bidding back to some of the things that are coming up on Grobulus, though, this one's coming up real soon. July 4th, Midsummer Fire Festival in Duratar. This is going to be a, one of the big July 4th celebrations, and it's really going to be just one in a series of great celebrations that are going to be happening on Grobulus during the summer. Even not in Grobulus, uh, you know, the 4th of July, at least in the in the state side, is going to be a pretty big holiday, so... And I mean, they even have things going on in-game because of the Fire Festival, so there's already that immediate tie-in, too. So there's just, you know, there's a lot of festivity going on, right now in the game and then of course the big one that is going to be happening at the end of the summer burning grob is going to be absolutely incredible and classic wow with Mao absolutely has some plans for this so we're not going to leak them just yet but just know burning grob when it comes in august we are not only prepared for it but we've got some uh, big plans and we will let you guys know about them as soon as uh We've got all the details mended out for that. Well, oh, man, we've got to, we've probably got to talk to Black Plague and see what the contingency plan is. What if Bert, Bert and Grob is going to happen right around three weeks after the gates patch? Yeah, this is a, it's going to be interesting. And uh, we might, I might be working a overtime or double time that week because of how much excitement is going on in uh, WoW Classic that week. Because I, uh, I won't be missing any of it. No, I just I'm I'm worried that the servers are gonna have stability problems. If what if what if we open the, the gates the same day of Burning Grub? That gong gets rung. It's gonna be a party and more than just just Tanneris. Yeah, it is. Uh, that is gonna be quite the party with uh, some unexpected guests. Oh yeah, there's there may be we, Burning Grub may need to prepare for some crashers. <laughs> Yeah, I uh, man, wouldn't that be something, though, to uh, just add a little bit of element? And it might actually be one of those things that uh, it'll either bring the two factions together or turn it into a bloodbath. 
I'm uh, I'm oh hoping to God. see them, us come together a little bit for that event. But uh, man, if those two did, uh, man, who knows what could happen? Wait, what do you, do you remember off the top of your head what exact time Burning Grub is planning on starting? Is it like 5 p.m. server? I don't have the exact time in front of me, but I want to say that sounds about right. We'll verify that in a later episode, so uh, don't take it um, at this episode for face value, but I want to say sometime around 5 p.m. sounds about right. Imagine if we had the faction, if we had the gate opening, 10 hours, event, end, right as Burning Grom started. Wow, that would actually be a pretty righteous kickoff. Like, everybody opens the gates, and then we celebrate with Burning Grob after 10 hours of murdering giant Anubisoth. You know, a party in the desert before we go even deeper into the desert ruins would be actually kind of perfect, I think. That's what we got to do, Grobulus. We got to plan to open the gates on the one-year anniversary of Classic WoW during 10 hours before Burning Grob starts. Would pretty much be the most epic bash that the server could possibly have concocted it would be the most epic bash in the history of an mmo like you, there there is no greater historical event than the gate opening combining that with our incredible with i mean with with the server's incredible rp community planning an amazing, amazing bash. Like, I can't think... We could even have, like, a showcase of, like, all the Scarab Lords. Man, that would be insane. Yeah, just the... I can't wait to see how it all ties together because that's going to be kind of what's cool about it. We're going to be in a new phase. There's going... We know we're going to be in that phase. There's going to be some mystery surrounded about what's going on. And it's it's just going to be a great celebration uh, the one year, the new events, the server as a whole, you know, it's, it, you know, it couldn't be timed any better. Is there anything else going on on the server of Grobulus that's caught your attention, Myth? Uh, nope. Just, you know, farming up herbs for AQ, just saving up as much as I can find and mats for this and that. Other than that, I, uh, you know, I haven't seen any new PVP videos lately. Yeah, we've, uh, definitely hit that phase where we've been kind of in this zone for a little while so the the new news should definitely catch some attention thank you very much for listening please like and subscribe on soundcloud on youtube and especially on twitch by the way just throwing this out there if you happen to be a twitch prime subscriber and you don't know where to throw that twitch prime feel free to throw it uh, in the direction of the Classic Wow with Mal podcast. We would greatly appreciate anybody who uh, has a Amazon Prime sub on their Twitch account that uh, they wouldn't mind kicking to us every once in a while. And we will continue to post the latest and greatest that we see from Wow and the server of Grobulus while you do that. But thank you once again for listening. We will talk to you again next week.